Welcome to Bruce Hurwitz Presents Meet the Experts. I'm your host, Bruce Hurwitz of Hurwitz Strategic Staffing. You can find us on the web at hsstaffing.com. I hope you'll consider us for all your staffing, career counseling, and professional writing needs. Meet the Experts is sponsored by PK CPAs. PK is a full service accounting firm. They provide accounting and consulting services to businesses ranging from startups to small and mid cap companies to nonprofits as well as high net worth individuals. Contact them today for a free consultation at info at pk cpas.com or call them at 973 882 8810. They will be happy to be of service. Shannon, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It is my pleasure. Please take a moment or two and introduce yourself to our viewers. Sure. I'm Shannon Pearson. I'm currently the um, Chief Experience Officer for a company called the Carolina Experience, um, but I am a life career long, anyway, <laughs> time uh, hospitality expert who um, has really focused in arts, um, entertainment, music, and recently moved into the hotel and short-term rental space. So I'm really excited to be here and talk more about that. That was a mistake. Shouldn't have turned off the light. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you on. Mm -hmm. I told you before we began that I'm interested in hospitality. And the reason is that years ago, I went to, I was a fundraiser and I went to a um, talk given by the president of a uh, Connecticut uh, college mm -hmm. on fundraising to women, because okay. at the time it was felt that women would be the largest uh, demographic right. for fundraising because they were due to inherit, I think a trillion dollars, something like that. Okay. This was 20, 25 years ago. Right. But what she said, something that surprised a lot of people. Mm -hmm. She said that the number one revenue stream for the city was not sports, but arts. Right. And that got me thinking that if you've got sports and you've got art, you've also got a need for hotel rooms right. and restaurants and bars. Right. In a word, hospitality. Mm -hmm. What percentage would you say of local income, New York, anywhere, it doesn't really matter, just uh, in general across the country, what mm -hmm. percentage comes from the hospitality industry? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, in, in this day and age where we've got tours that are grossing you know, billions with an S of dollars um, from incredible female artists and, um, you know, sports mania, it's, it's an immense amount. And um, even in some of the smaller towns that I'm working in currently within very specifically North Carolina, um, I would say sometimes those towns and their tourism directors are telling me that we're working over 50% for that, which is really incredible, um, considering, right, you can be talking about New York City, or you can be talking about Elkin, North Carolina, but a lot of the same things are happening, you know, no matter what the size of the stage is, per se. What constitutes hospitality? Hospitality is... I mean, the industries. Oh, right. Gotcha. Um, the industry is, is, is so wide ranging. It's interesting. I was just speaking to someone yesterday who owns a gym. And um, we were talking about doing some cross marketing and she kept saying to me, you know, gym ownership is hospitality. And it's so true. So really the industries are so wide ranging. I mean, you automatically think of restaurant, hotel, um, you know, club, live music, things of that nature, maybe more in the arts and, and entertainment, travel, tourism arena. But um, really any any business that's doing direct interaction with people and servicing people and serving people uh, to me is, is within the tourism and hospitality industry. What does it take to be successful in the hospitality industry? It, it takes caring about people. Um, it takes being a, a generous and welcoming and friendly place for people to see experience or be. Um, and again, that's such a wide range, but I think it takes knowing 
your, not just your client, but knowing your community, um, understanding what they want, what they need, um, what, what makes them happy, what makes them feel engaged and seen and heard. Um, and so it's really important as a business to really drill down into, again, not only your specific consumer or client or guest, uh, but also the community and city and town and area where you reside. Um, it's so important to kind of understand the the details and all of that. Without getting into the politics of it, uh, Anheuser-Busch, otherwise known as Bud Light, and Target mm -hmm. lost sight of their um, knowing who their client was, and it cost them billions of dollars, as you said, with an S on the end. Right. Uh, if you're running sports, if the hospitality industry client mm -hmm. is focused on, on a sport, then you know that the person likes a specific sport or a specific team, one mm -hmm. of two teams. Right. If it's art, you know they like classical music, they like ballet, they like rock music whatever but even within those groups you've got a wider range of people it's not monolithic by any stress of the map of the imagination so how can what is the are the common denominators mm -hmm. for all persons who are taking advantage or utilizing the hospitality industry it's a great question because no matter what industry you're in or the experiences that I've had across the hospitality industry, you're dealing with so many folks with so many different needs, so many different likes and dislikes. Um, so it is so it's really important when you're trying to prioritize um, providing the highest level of hospitality to understand, right? What what are the um, common denominators? What what brings everyone together? And throughout my career, what I've um, come to decide is that that is is really providing a soft and kind place. And I know sometimes that sounds a little um, Pollyanna, if you will, and that and I'm okay with that because that's the kind of specialized hospitality that I have worked to build and grow in my career through you know multitude of different industries and companies. But to me, and from my experience, everyone wants to be treated with kindness and understanding and a little shot of home. And, and that doesn't just work for hotel, that works for years that I spent culti you know, cultivating and engaging in experiences built around live music venues. And But folks wanna feel comfortable, they wanna feel seen, they wanna feel heard, um, and they want a little bit of kindness. They want a warm hello, they want someone to remember their drink order or remember their favorite layout in the suite that they like in the hotel that they come to. And so to me, it's back to basics. And it's really, um, you can find a lot of commonality there, no matter who your traveler is, who your guest is, who your client is. Just thinking, I don't remember where, where it was. It was a restaurant. And I hadn't been there for like five, six years. And I walked in and the owner came over and he remembered my name. And it just, that was it. I mean, I, I didn't know what to say. That is hospitality. That's, That's hospitality. The most beautiful hospitality. And when I hear things like that, again, I'm, I'm just obsessed with it, but it just makes me happy because that is someone who truly understands how to create, you know, a, a hospitality experience, a high-end hospitality experience. Culture. For me, because I work, in essence, in HR in one way or the other, right. it's very important. Right. When you are looking for an employee, mm -hmm. I don't care who, what the position is. I'm one of those that says that uh, there's no hierarchy. You don't say from the housekeeper to the manager. No, I mean, the housekeeper can do a lot of damage and the manager can do a lot of ma damage as well. Absolutely. How do you know if somebody is going to be a cultural fit? And I'll just tell one quick story, a bartender. And when we met, I said, listen, you're not going to make any money off of me because I don't drink. And he laughed and we became chummy. And 
he told me that he had a friend who was having difficulty hiring people to work at his Starbucks franchise. Mm -hmm. It was either at uh, JFK or LaGuardia. Mm -hmm. And then he came up with one. The problem was they weren't showing up for work. So he mm -hmm. came up with a brilliant idea. At least I think it's brilliant. If somebody was supposed to work the um, 1 a.m. to 8 a.m. shift, he would interview them at 3 a.m. <laughs> they didn't show up for their 3 a.m. interview. They weren't going to show up for their 3 a.m. shift. <laughs> so that goes to culture. Yeah. How do you know when you're interviewing who's going to be a cultural fit? So I always start every interview with the same question. I always ask, what is your feeling around the question? Is the guest always right? Um, and you get such a multitude and variety of answers and there is no right answer, but the folks that take me down the path of yes are the folks that I know I want to continue talking to. And there's a lot of detail that goes into that. We, I understand that, you know, obviously can't always be right and there's going to be situations, et cetera, but I see that positivity in folks that want to immediately say to me, yes. My client, my guest is always right. We'll find a way to make them right if they're not right. Um, and so I know right away that 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 that's going to be a great culture fit. And, and you know, I want to dive in more because there's always a way in hospitality to make the guests feel and be right in the situation that we, you know, the experience we've created for them. Now, be careful, because I can ask you a lot of embarrassing questions. My <laughs> answer would have been. The guest is not always right, but the guest is always the guest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's a beautiful answer. Because I, again, I understand that there is, believe me, working in years of nightclubs and hotels, I could tell you some stories. But um... <laughs> okay, I'm looking at your bio, which you said we can share. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let it go that you're a Yankees fan. <laughs> And how you can be in a Yankees fan and live in North Carolina, I do not understand. Quietly. 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 <laughs> now, you have a husband. I know what a husband is. I know what a son is. I know what a daughter is. But I have absolutely no ideas. And I know this is off topic. topic. But I didn't get a chance. My fault. Uh, what in the name of the Confederacy <laughs> is a Bernadoodle? <laughs> ah, Frankie and Murphy. The famous Frankie and Murphy are my two super sweet Bernadoodles. It's a Bernie's Mountain Dog and a Poodle mix. Oh, that's just not right. <laughs> oh, everything about them is right. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. That that that's wrong. That, 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 uh, Bernadoodles. Uh, the burn. The bur What do you call them? burn? The burn. Mountain dogs. Bernie's Mountain dogs. They're big. They're huge. They're, you know, like Newfoundlanders or yeah. um, St. Bernard's. Yep. And a poodle. <laughs> what are they? Hypoallergenic? They are. They are. Yeah, that's what I'm... <laughs> And I suppose that they took ownership of your children? Oh, yeah. Most certainly. Yeah. I have to do I very well. Told many people. And they all laughed at me. And those that went ahead and did it, it eventually begrudgingly had to admit it the best babysitter in the world is a dog oh 100 percent. you don't need to um baby proof your um, home if you've got a dog a million yes couldn't agree more <laughs> okay so now that we're back on the same page no embarrassing questions <laughs> everyone wants their experience to be perfect mm -hmm. they want their seat in the auditorium or the stadium to be solid and not broken they want their chair in the restaurant to be um solid and not um, <laughs> rickety right they want their hot food hot their cold food cold yep. there are so many different aspects of hospitality how do successful managers juggle everything? I think the first step of that is is going back to making sure that the folks on your team are a great culture fit from day one. And I 
I say that knowing that some of the folks that are my shining stars on my current team are folks that hadn't even ever had any hospitality experience, but they were willing to learn and they were, they were obsessed with guest experience. And so once I have that, I'm, I'm good from there. Um, but I rely so heavily on my eyes and ears on site at all of the properties. They're my quality control. They're my direct interaction interaction with the guest. They're my on-site marketing um, and advertising. And so me as a, as a leader to my team who are actually my on-site folks, I matter so little in the great equation of things. It's making sure that they're happy, that they have the tools and resources that they need to make sure that that stay is perfect. And so if I have failed, it's because they don't, my team doesn't have the resources they need because I certainly know that they have the drive, ambition and and skills to create those perfect experiences. So it's making sure that they, you know, down to, to do they have enough mop heads to get through the month without having to, you know, call me for an emergency shipment or, um, you know, are they given the most up-to-date information on the marketing specials we're running? So it's really just empowering my team to do exactly what I know they can they can do. They just need the tools. The last time, and it was a long time ago, I was at a hotel. I was fascinated by the fact that you could go over to a kiosk and check in, mm -hmm. and you could check out from your hotel room, yeah. the television. Now, that was years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the technology has advanced since then. Uh, what is the relationship between technology and hospitality, seeing that hospi but, uh, technology, by definition, removes the human equation? Right. This has been a really interesting journey for me. So the current company that I'm with does all um, no-touch check-in. So you get a, a code, you go up to your hotel room door, you put that code in, you never have to see or speak to anyone. Um, same for your checkout. And, and we've integrated a lot of technology in everything from how you're booking to how we're following up with you afterwards. And so as a person who is really obsessed with that human to human contact interaction, creating, you know, very personalized and special experiences, it's been a fun challenge to make sure that ev everyone in my guest circle still feels very personally engaged while getting the perks and benefits of the you know ever evolving technology that we're trying to stay on top of and so we want you to be able to go into your hotel room without talking to anybody but once you get in if you do want to talk to somebody we're picking up on the first ring um you know we have a concierge that will stop by and make sure that you're okay or send you a text if that's what you've indicated you prefer so we try to still personalize the experience as much as possible and that's really important to me you know, while making sure that it's still seamless and as um, low maintenance as a, a guest would want, basically. Years ago, I was at the, uh, excuse me. This is why I asked you if you had something to drink. <laughs> it's like an umbrella. <laughs> if you take it with you, it doesn't rain. You leave right. it at home, of course. Absolutely. I was at a Peachtree Hotel in mm -hmm. Atlanta, and I know everything in Georgia is Peachtree. Yeah. <laughs> and it had a thousand floors mm -hmm. and a beautiful atrium and glass elevators. And I suffer from vertigo. Oh. But as long as I have something to hold on to, I can convince my brain that it's being silly, it's phobia, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I got onto this elevator and there were other people obviously in it and they got off. My floor was fairly high up. Mm -hmm. And when most of the people exited, all of a sudden I noticed a woman standing right by the uh, back mm -hmm. holding white knuckled onto the um, railing. Right. And I can recognize my own kind. <laughs> right. So I didn't let anybody else on the elevator. Right. Okay. So I'm sorry, there's a situation and this woman hasn't reacted. She is staring straight ahead, scared to death. Right. Glass all around. As we're going down and I'm stopping people from getting in, I'm saying to myself, 
I'm going to get shot when we get to the ground floor because they don't know what's going on. Right. Doors open on the ground floor and a gentleman gets on who's six feet in any direction you care to uh, choose. <laughs> and I start to talk. He said, don't need, sir. Please exit the um, take your bag and exit the elevator. And he went over and he spoke to the woman, pried her hand off, took her out. He thanked me. Uh, he said something like, you've done good. <laughs> um, and got back on. End of story. Right. That's one type of security. And then they told me afterwards, the manager uh, came over to me to thank me. And he said, uh, you know, I said, well, why didn't you give her a, a room on the lower floor? And he said, she didn't tell us. She had told <laughs> us. He said, we keep rooms empty on the first, second, and third floors for people with vertigo and Orthodox Jews who on the Sabbath won't take the elevator. Right. Okay, fine. Simple solution. She Beautiful. Didn't <laughs> now, security is one thing, safety is another. How do you deal with both? Something we're very aware of. And honestly, something our guests have made us very aware of, which we love, you know, we love feedback. And so folks who have not dealt with specifically that digital entry before sometimes feel um, a, a little nervous about it, which I completely understand. Sometimes there's just a little bit of grounding in talking to a front desk and receiving a key and it's just your key and, and you're headed in. So um, we have a lot of ways that we like to, to keep things super tight, specifically with how we generate the codes, ensuring that they're one-time use, ensuring that you know folks are aware and comfortable with that. Um, and down to the locking mechanisms on both the door, the front door of the hotel, the door of, of your actual unit. Um, we've had a lot of feedback too about um, Wi-Fi safety and security, making sure that in a hotel you're not, you know, you're able to have the connectivity in your room, not broadcasting your data to all 15 to 25 other rooms. And so we've got a lot of folks on our operations team that focus on those things from right from physical security, right on down to data security and otherwise. So it's something that we deal with on a daily basis. And we want to be sure to be very upfront and open with our guests about, about the steps that we take um, as much as we want to, from a, a cleaning and turnover perspective, we want to from a security perspective as well, so that any traveler feels and knows that we're doing everything in our power and, and potential to keep them, you know, the utmost safety for, for their stay. You said 15 to 20 units. How, mm -hmm. tell me about your properties. Yeah, so we, uh, the currently with the Carolina experience, we focus more on boutique um, hotels and, and small properties in really cool towns throughout North Carolina. So towns that I didn't know before I joined this company, but now that I'm head over heels in love with. Um, but yeah, we we average anywhere from six to, to 20 rooms um, in more of a boutique setting. Every room is decorated a little different. It's really fun. Um, all digital entry. So again, we try to stay on the cutting edge and cusp of making sure access is really easy and safe. But I want to make sure that every experience is really connected to the, to the town and community local art in the rooms, um, local designers used to, to get those rooms set up, um, local experiences connected. So when you book our rooms, you can book a yoga class that's local, book a painting class. We make it super simple. Um, so we're all, all about community, specifically in these really cool boutique hotels in these great towns across North Carolina. I've been in boutique hotels in Manhattan. Okay. One or two. And they were very artsy. Mm -hmm. A lot of young people and a lot of people in the lobby who were just in the lobby for the free Wi-Fi, <laughs> which can be nice and it can be aggravating. It can be aggravating. <laughs> I'm sure if you're paying whatever it is, uh, $200, $300 for a night in a hotel in uh, Manhattan, you don't want to share it with some um, hippie. Right. Beatnik, <laughs> right? <laughs> millennial, <laughs> who's uh, there for the Wi Fi, Wi Wi Fi for the Wi Fi, and not paying anything, right? And now I forgot my question. <laughs> well, uh, thankfully, we've been able to walk a, a, a fine line. Um, we understand that a lot of our travelers are business travelers, so we really want to speak to the cool hipster millennial, but we also want to speak to, you know, our, our traveling mom who doesn't want to deal with any of that and doesn't care what's on the wall or, you know, what 
crazy gadget is in there and just wants to get a good night's sleep. So we do try to keep it, um, you know, as, as in the middle as humanly possible. And thankfully we have such amazing uh, partnerships in these communities that um, everybody keeps an eye out for our, our great boutique hotels and make sure that our lobbies don't get too crazy. <laughs> Do you ever have a situation where someone checks into the hotel and not appreciating what a boutique hotel is, they realize this is not going to work for them? Right. How do you handle something like that? I mean, yeah. your website's honest. They see the pictures. They know what, where they're going, but they don't understand it. Right. It happens a lot, um, and we completely understand that my team is trained to quickly and effectively solve the situation for them. Um, it doesn't, it's okay if you didn't understand. And so a lot of folks will get on site and say, I do not like not having a front desk. That's not comfortable for me, um, et cetera. And, and that's okay. We're not going to hold them hostage in a situation that doesn't make them comfortable. So it's all about guest recovery at that point um, and making sure that we can, you know, get them to where they're comfortable, get their money back to them and let them move on their, on their experience to hospitality that suits them in a better fashion. So we try to be really understanding and open about the fact that we're a little different and that's not for everyone. And we don't want anyone to feel stuck or uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's an experience certainly. So we focus a lot on guest recovery and just because someone wasn't comfortable with us then maybe Maybe down the road, they're comfortable referring us to someone else. And so it's important to close the, the experience on a high note, even if that doesn't mean them staying the evening with us or finishing out their stay. Say, I learned a long time ago, saying no, rejecting somebody as a client can be a great way to get new clients. <laughs> right. Exactly. Absolutely. Do, do you offer business services? Um, we we do. Um, we are expanding into some um, additional consulting and additional um, you know business services outside of just running and managing and maintaining. Oh, no, the no, 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 that's not what I meant. I meant I, uh, at hotels here mm -hmm. there'll be a business office. Oh, I got you. I'm sorry. Go yeah. and use a computer. Gotcha. Get a fax. If anybody sends facts anymore, <laughs> they do. That type, you know, business services for the guests. Right, right. No, absolutely, because we market heavily to the enterprise client, and so it's really important for us that we are getting folks traveling for business. So we don't have any business centers in our hotels. Again, they're all fairly small, and so our um, common areas are normally a rooftop deck, or um, in one of our boutique hotels, we have a great speakeasy lounge. So, but we try to make sure that the rooms are are complementary of working. So we make sure that there's a laptop friendly workspace, a comfortable chair, great high speed Wi Fi. Um, so those are all really paramount when we're setting up, organizing, and maintaining the rooms. Do you offer special rates to people who have a recording of you that can be edited to make you appear to have said things that are inappropriate? Free, I think. Free, <laughs> okay. I just, just want to check. <laughs> and as we have obviously got, got, got <laughs> into the end, and before I get into any more trouble, I want to <laughs> thank you, put up your contact information, and I have one final question for you. Yeah. Is there anything I did not ask you that you wish I had asked you? And if I had asked you, what would you have said? No, I think I think just getting to talk about my favorite part of hospitality, which is the guest engagement and and just treating people how they should be treated is is my favorite thing to talk about. And you let me talk about that. So I'm thrilled and I really enjoyed the conversation. And if you come back. If you want to bring your children, you may, but I would really like to meet your dogs. Amazing. They will they would love to, to be uh, superstars on the show. <laughs> it has happened, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah. And it was one of my better um, interviews. <laughs> Shannon, thank you very much. Thank it's you so much. I really appreciated enjoyable it. Enjoyable and informative. Thank you. I'm Bruce Hurwitz. Thank you for watching. And as always, please stay focused on success.